Hey, what's going on? How you doing today? I am David Long. I am just coming today to share with you some clips from my video that I recently made about addressing integral integrity with Steve McIntosh. It's kind of a long video, so I decided to break it into some parts, into some clips, and share it with you. If you enjoy this, feel free to check out the full-length version right here. Enjoy. Warning, the following video is using integral language and distinctions. I will try to explain as I go, but to some extent it is assuming that you are integrally informed or have some knowledge of integral theory already. If you do not, you can find intro material on my I Am David Long YouTube page. Ultimate reality is an experience. It's not just cosmic speculation. It is legitimately possible to experience directly in a spiritual experience ultimate reality. And saints and sages down through the ages have glimpsed the ultimate and brought back reports of its character and, and its nature and its quality. Yes, it's true that saints and sages have brought back stories from these amazing experiences that they've had. But what they have to say about the absolute is not only contradictory, but it's from a human limited perspective. God has not revealed himself to me. Even if he did, I'm not sure how I could be confident that it wasn't just some kind of delusion reinforced by my desires or my culture. Oh, trust me, you'd know. God revealed himself to me. Me too. Oh, really? Pleased to meet you. I have felt God in my heart. God speaks to me. I have a close personal relationship with God. Me too. Amen. You see, God isn't silent. He speaks to us all. Right? We can't all be wrong. You just need to open the door when you hear God knock. We all have a close personal relationship with God. And you can too. Just accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on there. Jesus, peace be upon him, was a prophet, but he was not God. Yes, he is. The only way to be saved is through faith in Jesus Christ. Well, not faith alone. Faith without works is dead. Uh, not so fast. All of our righteous acts are like filthy rags to God. It doesn't matter. God loves us all. We will all go to heaven and see the truth then. You think even Hitler is going to heaven? Even Hitler. I'm sorry, but Hitler's got to burn. Uh, not if you repented. Hitler's going to hell. You've all been blinded by Satan. Jesus visited the Indians and cursed black people. Say what? And I'm going to get my own planet after I die. Not if Zeno escapes his volcano prison. Say what? Oogly scoogle kootalulu labi dabi kaka slop. I believe I can straighten this all out. <laughs> we Jews are the chosen people. Chosen for what? To steal other people's lands? That land was rightfully given to us by God. It was not! If God is speaking to all of you, then he appears to be telling all of you very different, contradictory things. Perhaps this rather glaring discrepancy can be explained if we examine the fact that your relationship with God seems to be precisely shaped by the culture in which you were raised and the predominant version of God you were taught to believe in. Sure, there are exceptions, but typically religion obeys borders, while truth does not. In America, God is Yahweh. While in India, God is Vishnu. The truth does not behave this way. In America, 2 plus 2 is 4, and in India, 2 plus 2 also equals 4. If God's message to us was so dire, so vitally important, then why wouldn't he give it to us in such a clear and precise way, rather than trusting his precious message to be spread by fallible, corruptible human beings? Why would Almighty God allow the continuation of such widespread falsehoods in his name, which would be effortless for him to correct, or never even need to correct in the first place, because a perfect being would have gotten it right from the very beginning? On one side, on our interiors, we have our subjective experience. And then on the other side, there's objective reality. And in the middle, there's a relative filter of culturally constructed meanings, values, and symbols. We have our subjective experience, and everything that we know has been communicated to us by some person in the objective reality. So we get, coming this way, sense information. You see things, you hear things, that's all sense information. It shapes your perspective, and it expands your perspective. 
and you have this expression and projection which defines your experience. So we have incredibly limited perspectives and everything that we know is based on our experience of the objective reality, which in a sense has already been predefined based on what we had previously known. So we're always experiencing any new situation in the light of what we had already understood and what had already been communicated to us by people in our culture. And this is called the hermeneutic circle. Hermeneutic circle is a philosophical term that refers to concepts that explain each other and that mean each other for their full understanding. So spiritual teachings instruct us about spiritual practice. Uh, spiritual practice leads to spiritual experience. Spiritual experience then informs and enhances our understanding of spiritual truth. And so evolutionary spirituality attempts to increase our hold on spiritual experience, to bring that more abundantly into our lives by working on spiritual teachings, by improving the spiritual teachings that are on offer in our culture. Actually, let me just say that when you first get introduced into a new tradition, you get taught the spiritual teachings. Then you get introduced into the spiritual practices, you might have a spiritual experience, and you will then interpret that experience in the light of the spiritual teachings. This is called cultural conditioning. This is called confirmation bias. This is called circular reasoning. What I would not call it is evolutionary spirituality. It's the same kind of trap that tons of pre-rational people get trapped in. All wild animals have to be kind of natural statisticians, looking for patterns in the apparent randomness of nature when they're looking for food or trying to avoid predators. There are two kinds of mistakes they can make. They can either fail to detect pattern when there is some, or they can seem to detect pattern when there isn't any, and that's superstition. Sixty years ago, the American psychologist B.F. Skinner investigated the behavior of pigeons, rewarding them with food when they learned to pack a key in the feeding apparatus. But then, Skinner set the apparatus to reward the birds at random. Now the pigeons just have to sit back and wait. But that isn't what they did. Instead, the majority developed what Skinner called superstitious behavior. When an individual pigeon, for example, happened to look over its left shoulder, and the reward mechanism just happened to pick in at that point, it would have got the idea that it was looking over the left shoulder that had got it the reward, so it tried it again. By sheer luck, as it happened, the reward mechanism delivered food at the same time again. And so the pigeon was reinforced in its idea that looking over the left shoulder was what got it the reward. And it went on and on and turned into a maniac looking over the left shoulder. When it comes to the absolute, the way to know it is not going to be through some subjective experience. Any understanding of an experience that you have, any words that you could say about an experience of the absolute is absolutely wrong. And there's no way out of that hermeneutic circle of interpretation. There's no view from nowhere. There's no getting outside of everything. And it's when you start to think about or interpret that experience, that's when it gets culturally molded. That's when you take whatever ideas you happen to have at the time and you try to explain it in terms of those. That's where we go wrong in understanding what these experiences are and understanding the reality that we live in. So this can be majorly problematic. So not only can these experiences be majorly transformative, they can be majorly confusing and stifling. Any religion or spirituality in the future will be focused increasingly on the direct experience of spirit. So what is the spiritual experience? The presence of the infinite. Look at the great traditions. They all agree that there are at least four, usually five, major states of consciousness that everybody has access to. Waking, dreaming, deep sleep are the simplest. I'm writing this just across the top. It's gross, subtle, causal, and non-dual. The waking state, dreaming state, deep, formless sleep state. What we find is that if you take somebody at a particular stage of development, and here I'm using the simple gene gaps or stages. So I've written archaic, magic, mythic, traditional, 
rational or modern, pluralistic or postmodern, and integral or hybrid. You can be at a traditional mythic stage, and if you experience these states, you'll interpret it in those terms. Because you only have the mind to interpret what's arising. If you have a peak experience, as I was saying, let's say you're at the mythic stage or wave of development, and you have an experience of a subtle being of light, and you come from a culture that's Christian, you very likely interpret that as Jesus, perhaps. You can be at the rational level of development, like Bertrand Russell was, for example, and he had the experience of nature mysticism, but he interpreted it, of course, in rational terms. That's just sort of that's almost all you can do. And if you experience these states, you'll interpret it in those terms. Because you only have the mind to interpret what's arising. It's very common. It's culturally molded. Because you only have the mind to interpret what's arising. It's very common. It's culturally molded. If you're in China or in Southeast Asia and you have an experience of light, it might very well have 10,000 arms. It might very well be that will be Shwara. You're never going to find a Southern Baptist seeing 10,000 arms. I mean, it's just very, very rare. Having an experience of undivided consciousness does not tell you what consciousness really is or what its relationship to the brain really is. There's nothing about introspection that leads you to sense that your subjectivity is at all dependent or even related to voltage changes and chemical interactions going on inside your head. You can drop acid, you can meditate for a year, you can do whatever you want to perturb your nervous system. You can, you can feel yourself to be one with the universe, and at no point in that transformation do you get a glimpse that there's a hundred trillion neurons in your head or synapses in your head that, that are doing anything. It's called absolute subjective ignorance of what's actually going on outside your consciousness. and cannot possibly be That's justified based on... That's why it's a statement based, of metaphysics, based not of physics. On, no, no, metaphysical statements also have to be justified, as it turns out. <laughs> Metaphysics uh, statements come from subjective experiences. No, metaphysical statements also have to be justified, as it turns out. <laughs> okay, now let's check out this graph. This has to do with what counts as evidence. For example, a lot of religious people will say that their religious experiences are good evidence of God or some truth about the cosmos. So in the upper left, you have someone's intention, their consciousness, known by their felt experience. Now you may know what you felt, and that is a type of fact, as we've already said, but let's say if you're doing meditation or something, no amount of looking at the inside of your mind is going to be able to tell you truths about the external reality. If you go to the upper right, you have behavior, objective realities of all beings at all levels of organization, and it's known by measurement. So this could just be tangible facts. One plus one is two. That's how you know objective things. In the lower left, it says it's culture, known by mutual resonance, intersubjective realities of all beings. So how do we know what people feel or what the meaning of something is? We ask a bunch of people, and that's a type of truth, too. It's not the whole truth. It's a type of relative cultural meaning of truth. Then in the lower right, you have systems theory, known by systemic analysis, interobjective realities of all beings at all levels of intersection. So, for example, the kinds of reasons that you have for idealistic metaphysical claims are going to be based on upper left quadrant felt experiences and through lower left traditional dogma and indoctrination, cultural conditioning. The way that we know that consciousness is a byproduct of matter is known by systemic analysis. So, in a sense, you have idealism making claims about the ultimate truth of reality based on cultural meanings and felt experiences, and you have materialism, which is known through objective measurement and systemic analysis. I would tell you, idealism is qualifying the unqualifiable, making claims about things that are beyond anyone's ability to make claims about. Whereas, to some extent, materialism is a relative fact. It doesn't get at the ultimate truth of everything, and it can't be reduced to mere empiricism, but we can know, based on the cosmology that we already have, that consciousness is a byproduct of matter, not the source of matter. So, depending on what kind of claim you're making, you have to look at the relative quadrant to get the data so, for example, taking a vote is not a way to get at the objective truth. Looking at your still mind is not a way to know the truth about cosmology. And measuring someone's brain waves is not a good way to know what their felt experience is like. So all of these disciplines have to be qualified in their own quadrants. But these saints and sages differ widely about their... their you know, there's not clear agreement about what is ultimate, even among the most advanced forms of spirituality. But, of course, different spiritual traditions take this idea of spiritual infinity in different directions, right? So, like, Buddhism recognizes non-duality as infinite in its own way. Christianity recognizes God as infinite. So, the nice thing about the conceiving of spirit as a, as a, as a sort of a base mark is that it, it's, it's agreeable um, while still being uh, descriptive. Uh, Alfred North Whitehead or Sri Aurobindo in the 20th century uh, were big proponents of the central significance of these 
values or these concepts on the spiritual path. So he's basically advocating for mishmashing together all kinds of idealistic worldviews that are completely different under the heading of spirit, squishing things together that don't go together just by using the same word like spirit or God or something like that. People like Whitehead and Aurobindo and Chardin, all idealists and dualists in terms of cosmology and metaphysics, but none of these people agree about what spirit is in terms of the details. This is more of this green false attempts at consensus and bad integration, pre-trans confusion. They're true in different senses, do you see? Uh, here's a whole mythology based on the insight that transcends duality. Ours is a mythology that's based on the insight of duality. And this, this idea that all religions are essentially the same, it blinds us to the distinctions that we need to see in order to understand them, but it also blinds us to the unique beauty that we find in each of the religions. If basically Taoism is essentially the same as Christianity, well, what is there to learn from studying Taoism? What's the difference between a Taoist in China and a uh, Christian in, here in Washington, D.C.? Nobody with any intelligence says that the religions are exactly the same. I mean, clearly Muslims go on the Hajj to Mecca and Christians don't go on the Hajj to Mecca. And Muslims don't follow the seven sacraments of Catholicism, nor do they follow the four uh, noble truths of Buddhism. So clearly there are differences across religions, and that isn't the, the question. The question is whether those differences matter, whether those differences are, as many say, inessential or inconsequential. And I frankly think it's condescending to say, oh, well, the Hajj doesn't really matter. Tell a Muslim that. Like, how can it not matter? It's one of the five pillars of Islam or the five prayers a day that Muslims insist on, also as part of the five pillars of Islam. Um, What's inconsequential or inessential about that? What always happens when people want to push the great religions into one box, into one mountaintop, right, rather than many mountaintops, is you come up with your own ad hoc idea of what the mountain mountaintop is, right? Oops, it just happens to be my, my vision of what religion should be. The presence of the infinite. Right, so maybe it's there's, ultimately there's one God. This loving creator that lives within us and that knows us. Who maybe sounds and talks and walks a lot like Jesus. Or, you know, maybe it's the mystical experience, which just happens to be the piece of religion that you value. Any religion or spirituality of the future will be focused increasingly on the direct experience of spirit. So what is the spiritual experience? The presence of the infinite. Or maybe it's, it's compassion, which just happens to be your particular preoccupation with what the religion should be doing. But in any case, it's you. Pierre, Pierre, de Jardin. And he had a famous concept of the omega point. And I think it's interesting. Look at the issue of race, for example, race and ethnicity. You know, there was a time when we thought that the way to get along was to be colorblind, right? To sort of just pretend. But we're all human beings. Who cares if somebody's black or somebody's Hispanic or somebody's Chicana or if somebody's, you know, Chinese? It doesn't matter. Well, we figured out that, that that didn't work because always what happens there is somebody insinuates it's usually a white person of privilege, insinuates into the generic human being their sense of what it is to be human. And we've had the same thing with religion. There's too much of the insinuation of Christian values into this sort of generic human religiosity that people want to talk about. And I want to be able to hear what the Confucians say, what the Taoists say, what the Buddhists say, what the Jews say about what religion is, and that's what I try to do. Their partialities point to another major form of spiritual experience, of ultimate reality, that doesn't fit very well within a non-dual teaching frame. And I think that this, this idea of the love of God, especially when understood in the light of what we've learned from non-duality, points to a, a kind of its own attractor basis, a spiritual experience with its own specific practices. So just as, as if you take up meditation and you do it you know, vigorously uh, with rigor for years, it's likely that you may have a samadhi experience. And likewise, if you take up the practices of theistic spirituality, faith, prayer, practicing the presence of God, there's a similar kind of deep apogee or, or profound spiritual experience which has been described by saints and sages down through the ages. And that's being personally known and cared for by the source of the universe. 
And within progressive spirituality, the idea of faith and prayer is often conceived of as being merely a, a religious spiritual conception, you know, that we've sort of outgrown. And that's evolutionarily understandable. Pushing off against religious spirituality was a very important evolutionary project. The concept of the love of God, while generally okay within progressive spirituality, sort of toned down or philosophically ungrounded. Because love is irreducibly relational. Right? If there's only one thing, if there's no separation, then it's hard to ground philosophically this idea of love. But if we allow for a panentheist conception of creator and creature, and the idea of love, the love of God can be reclaimed in a way that doesn't cause us to regress to the mythic level of religious spirituality. So this is a big breakthrough for evolutionary spirituality. So the way he makes a case for his God is that he says there's an attractor basin, like if you comport yourself in this particular kind of way and condition yourself, you'll have this experience and that experience is the love of the Creator God. So basically, if you believe these kinds of things and do these kinds of practices, you'll have this kind of an experience. So what? That's not good evidence for this worldview. I mean, you could say that about almost any kind of religion or cult or anything. You could say that about STDs. I mean, like, I could come up with all kinds of foul examples or whatever, but just because there is a, an experience that you can get by convincing yourself into some kind of perspective doesn't at all imply that that makes it valid or worthwhile. Now I'm going to share with you just a taste of Terence McKenna talking about his DMT experience. And think about what Steve is saying about focusing more and more on personal spiritual experiences and these attractor basins where if you tune yourself in the right way with the right kind of conditioning and the right kind of focus and the right kind of practice, you will have these particular experiences. Think about these different justifications he's giving in defense of reducing evolutionary spirituality to his own particular flavor of spiritual experience. If you have the DMT experience, death by astonishment seems the major danger. And it is not a unitary experience. It's extremely multiplistic and it's extremely specific in its presentation. And when you smoke DMT, you have the feeling that you have burst into a place. And within that space, the first shock is that it's inhabited. They are like jeweled, self-dribbling basketballs. And there are many of them. And they come out of the background and they present themselves to you. They're literally vibrating up and down with excitement. They're faceted and rotating. And they see you as clearly as you see them. They even greet you. Some of you may recall the Pink Floyd song, The Gnomes Have Learned a New Way to Say Hooray. <laughs> as you burst into this space, the gnomes say hooray. And they present themselves and they are truly the gnomes of Central European fairy tales, archetypal gnomes. They're very humorous. They're very mercurial and delightful. Covers just on the edge of changing from mayhem to mania. Very intense. The most striking thing to me, and really the motivation for my career, is they are displaying new models of language that have never been seen before. They sing, and out of their singing elfin chatter, condense objects. And these hyperdimensional objects are themselves undergoing a dynamic transformation. They're not static. They are undergoing changes, singing, condensing other objects. These objects are crawling all over the ground in front of you, clamoring for your attention. Now remember, 12 seconds before you were sitting in a suburban living room somewhere grappling with some drug somebody wanted you to take. Now all that's gone, and here are these things. I call them tykes. The tykes want to initiate you. They have a message, and the message is, you can do what we are doing. And what they're doing is using their voices to make physical objects condense out of the air. And they're saying, you can do this. Do it. Do it. Do it. And they're on you, and they, they jump in and out of your chest, which is something that is described in the Amazon, too. And they are saying, do this thing. Do it. Do it. Suspend your belief. And eventually, you do do it. You discover that you can drop the filter of meaning, that your voice can move back several registers, and out comes elf chatter. And this elf chatter is able to wring the air in front of you like a washcloth and get alchemical gold to drip out of the air and to begin to condense in front of you. By this time, most people would like to call time out. There is no time out. It just 
keeps going. But the very first time I smoked DMT with absolutely no expectation, this happened to me. And it has happened every time since. And then I've had occasion to observe people taking DMT in countries where it's legal. And what I see is there is an archetype which surrounds DMT, which you must make your way through. The archetype is the circus or the carnival. It has two aspects. One is blazing light and activity. At the center of the triple ring, the lady in the spangled costume is high above the main floor, and the lions and the tigers and the clowns are parading around. That's part of it. But it has another aspect. Just off to the side of the big tent, there are the sideshows, the hoochie-coochie dancers, the two-headed man, and so forth and so on. In other words, there's this kinky, peculiar, shadow side of it. When you finally come into the center of it, these are all seen to be veils. If you have the DMT experience on the way to the center of that flash, you'll probably have all the other ones. Uh, it seems to lie at the center of the mandala. It veils itself that way because it's the old candy to the baby routine. It treats us as people who would like to go to the circus. And then it takes us to the circus, but then there is a revelation beyond that. I don't know how many people present in this room have confronted the thing I'm talking about. I always, at this moment, am aware that some people are saying, my, doesn't he perfectly get it? And other people are saying, huh? What is this? What is this guy talking about? The point I want to make is it's real. It's not vague. You don't have to strain for it. Nobody wonders whether or not it happened to them. It's just like somebody walking up to you and taking you by the arm and saying, there's something I insist on showing you. Come this way, please. It was the presence of the entities that shattered the person who I was. I had no room for elves in my cosmology. And here they were, hundreds of them. So is that what we want to say that evolutionary spirituality is? Why not? If we're going by the standards that Steve has laid out, then this very well could be an example of evolutionary spirituality. For my taste, I prefer this to what Steve is talking about. The presence of the entities. The presence of the infinite. The presence of the entities. The presence of the infinite. Think about what it might be like to try to have to incorporate every experience that might have some kind of an attractor basin around it. There's an interdependent polarity in these two major attractor bases of spiritual experience. And this can be understood as you know, non-dual oneness and the love of God. Within progressive spirituality, the pluralistic impulses want to say that they're the same thing, or they're just different paths to the top of the same mountain. And that's admirable. It's good to welcome everything and be pluralistically open and include. That's a good impulse. But we can, we can get to deeper truth than that and recognize that, that these two different kinds of spirituality are actually challenging each other, even while they complement each other. That is, they are like two legs of our progress. That the tension energy, that the existential challenge that one offers to the other is actually the energy that we need for transcendence itself. I mean, clearly there's, you know, non-dual ultimate reality is a very important part of ultimate reality. But there's another deep experience of ultimate reality, you know, as I'm describing the love of God, which in a sense challenges, right? Well, so, and of course, humanity has uh, developed both. I mean, in, in Buddhism and, and other non-theistic religions, it was done without, uh, expressly, without a creator God. Sure. And in the West, it was built all around a creator God. That itself, to me, as, you know, as citizen of the world argues that there's got to be some truth to both. That's a really simplistic view of religion. There are a ton of different religions and a ton of different inflections and a ton of different versions. And just because it exists, there's some truth to it is kind of a dangerous perspective. We want to integrate things in context and not just accept everything and be like, well, it exists. There must be something to it. Of course we want to integrate in everything, but everything in context, diversity with discernment, translation, and how you understand a thing is an important factor in including it. It's how we integrate things that makes all the difference. This is just a very simplistic view of what religion is and a very sloppy integration. First of all, Buddhism is based on a creation myth, the Hindu creation myth. Hinduism and Judaism are ethnocentric traditions, and out of those ethnocentric traditions grow Christianity and Buddhism, which are universal religions, but they're born out of the ethnocentric tradition. You're born a Hindu or a Jew, but you confess 
Buddhism or Christianity, but both Hinduism and Christianity are based on Hindu and Jewish assumptions about the nature of reality. But that's just one thing that's wrong with this. There's this kind of fundamental assumption that, that you have this paradoxical duality between the Eastern and the Western God. Well, this is not a fundamental dualistic paradox. These are two distinct, different cultural inflections of traditions among many. And there are many different other ones they are not factoring in. Old school shamanic stuff, any kind of pagan traditions. You do have this kind of duality of like the God on the inside and the God on the outside. The God who awoke up inside of and became the universe and the God who created the universe from the outside. But those are mutually exclusive stories. Those are not paradoxical dualities that somehow work together in some kind of way, like male and female, individual and communal, or anything like that. And they both focus on the absolute in their own way, whereas the more pagan traditions tend to be more this-worldly. So the Eastern and Western religions are both idealistic, and I can see why you can maybe find some common ground in spirit. But there are also these other traditions that need to be skillfully included and integrated a big part of what is being left out here would also deconstruct the idealistic worldview and put that in perspective to be able to get value out of all of this comparative mythology is what skillful integration looks like. So there's another fundamental paradox, if there is one, between a focus on the absolute and a focus on the imminent. But where is that included in this dualistic paradox? Or is it more that there are a plurality of different attractor basins? It's not just a matter of these sort of simplistic dualities. I do think that there's a way to study comparative mythology skillfully, and I don't think Steve is doing it. I think he's taking one story literally and arguing for its inclusion. In just a bit, I'll talk more about transrationality and how to actually translate and include all cultural symbolism, to see the poetry inherent in all these traditions without getting caught up in the superstitious muck of taking any of them literally, including what Steve is talking about and including what Terence McKenna is talking about. I think you can even kind of tell from the way he speaks about his experience that he knows that it's a symbolic, poetic, archetypal language. Speaking integrally, one of the problems that's happening here is that Steve, Terence McKenna, and a lot of these other idealists are looking in the wrong quadrant for data. They are looking in their upper left, personal, subjective, interior, imaginative consciousness, and then drawing conclusions about the exterior truth of the nature of reality. They're looking in the wrong quadrant for data. That's not how we do it. That's a major problem in methodology. I notice as I'm hearing you talk that there's a little thrill sensation arising in my body and in, in, in my psyche because to see this values gravity towards goodness, truth, and beauty just built into the system and to see how it's been unfolding, not only in the culture at large, but also in my own life and in history and in the whole history of the cosmos, it's starting to feel like there's not only an intelligence behind it, but also a love, or there's also a a loving intelligence or a personality at work here. And I wonder how this view can actually provide the basis of a deep spiritual life and practice that is post, postmodern, is post-mythic, where the scientific truth of evolution can be the basis for a, an authentic spiritual path. Yes, indeed. I mean, and I thanks for bringing that up. So we're like the portal that brings the infinite through into the finite. Human consciousness, because of its recognition of these elements of infinity, you know, the beauty, the true, and the good, as, they, as that light shines into the phenomenal world, the finite world, we see it as these values. 
And as our consciousness evolves, as the, the opening widens, we are able to see presence of the infinite with, with increasing depth and clarity. And this, in a sense, is sort of the new, the new truth of evolutionary spirituality that's revealed by our understanding of evolution itself. Wow. So cool. Yeah. Thanks for watching. You can check out the full length video right here. And here's the next part if you're interested as well.